Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. We're going to stand on our feet today. We're going to get started with today's Sunday service. Isn't it great to be in the house of God today? Amen. We're going to go and begin with today's prayer. If we can all lift up our hands right now, we're going to set our minds on God. Lord Jesus, we worship you. We thank you that we get to be in your house today, God, and that we get to glorify your name. We thank you, Lord, for the forgiveness of sins and for salvation and that your presence is already here, God. We love you, Lord, and we pray that you would set our minds and our hearts on you, Jesus, that your blood would cover us and that you would forgive us of every sin, oh God, and release every burden from our minds and our hearts right now. Today is all about you, God, and we want to be in your purpose today, God. We want our minds set in your purpose and be in line with you, God. Whatever you want to do today, do it, God. Let your kingdom come and let your will be done in this place as it is in heaven today, God. We worship you. Go ahead and glorify God today. Lift up your voice. God, we love you, Jesus. We worship you. You are the King of kings and Lord of lords. Hallelujah. If you love the Lord today, why don't you clap your hands? God, we love you. We love you, Jesus. Uh, lift up your voice and shout. Uh, God, you're worthy. Hallelujah. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Can anybody come to bless the name of Jesus this morning?
the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Hallelujah. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord this morning. Hallelujah. We are in the presence of the Lord. Amen. I feel the Holy Ghost, and I want you to know that whatever you need from the Lord, you can receive this morning. It doesn't matter. You know, when we pray, we, we sometimes have the idea that it's up to us and that if we're good enough, if we pray hard enough, receiving your healing, receiving your miracle has very little to do with you and all about the promises that God has already made. He's already promised us healing. He's already promised us deliverance. He's already promised us provision. So you can seek him knowing that you're just asking him to keep his word. You're just asking God to keep his word. Amen. Amen. We are in the presence of the Lord this morning. It's so exciting to have all of you here today. We're going to move into a time. We're going to bring you an, an, uh, an update on our Imagine campaign. We'll ask you to return to your seats for just a moment. Uh, if you're not aware of what our Imagine campaign is, this is our building program that we began last year. We initially started, wanted to start in 2020. Of course, nothing happened in 2020 the way that we wanted it to. But we began our Imagine campaign last year. And if you'd like more information about our Imagine campaign, there are some uh, packets in the foyer available to you. Uh, we can take time to explain it to you. If you're not involved, you want to get involved, amen, because God blesses folks when they bless his kingdom, amen. All right, Pentecostals, are you ready to hear the 2021 update, the year in review, year in results? Here we go. So those who received the Holy Ghost for the very first time in the year 2021, there were exactly 110 people who received the Holy Ghost for the very first time. Those who were baptized in Jesus' name, 89, were baptized in Jesus' name in 2021. First-time guests during 2021, this is a great number, 843 first-time guests here at the Pentecostals. Second-time guests, also an excellent number, 262 second-time guests. Amen. We have, have committed to this program 5 million three hundred. You five three million five it could be five million brother if you make your pledge today three million amen five hundred almost three point six and then uh what we received so far is five seventy five almost five hundred seventy six thousand dollars that's sixteen percent of our total commitment we have already received that's that's wonderful that's terrific amen if I want to remind you, if you have a testimony regarding the Imagine campaign, how God has blessed you through your faithfulness, uh, let brother and sister Winslow know we want to share those testimonies with the congregation. Every month when we bring our Imagine update, we like to share a spotlight video. And this month we're going to be talking about the prayer ministry. And Give heed to the video if you would, please. the Lord. Psalm 24 and 1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. That means you belong to the Lord. Do you love the Lord? Can we give the Lord a hand of praise? Amen. Jim Ron said, only by giving 
Are you able to receive more than you already have? Doesn't sound right, but somehow or another, when you let go, your hand is open to receive more. So this morning, we're going to take up our Sunday morning tithe and offering. If you need an envelope at this time, if you'd raise your hands, our ushers would be glad to bring you one. There are many ways to give, as you can see behind me on the screen. And, uh, I want to encourage you to be faithful to the Imagine campaign. That way, Brother Oyer doesn't hunt you down. Amen. We've got a few announcements this morning. January 20th. Uh-oh. I feel something. Is that you, Lord? Oh. Oh. Yes, sir. All right. Thank God. January 20th, Thursday nights. Somebody say Thursday nights. Financial Peace University taught by Brother Herb and Sister Sherry Winslow. Hey, Amen. If you want to learn how to get rich for Jesus. If you're interested in getting a handle on your finances, learning how to grow well so you can be a blessing to your family and to others, come and check out this class. Speak to Brother Herb and Sister Sherry Winslow. There's a sign-up sheet in the foyer. January 22nd, Saturday, 2 p.m., Audio and Video Ministry is having a meeting. We're asking all current AB team members to attend this brief but very important meeting. Also, if you were ever interested in learning how the AV team helps our services, to sound and to look great on TV or live online, you're welcome. You're invited to come as well. January 28th and 29th, that's a Friday and Friday night and a Saturday morning, POK Marriage Weekend with special guest, Brother Dowdy, uh, Dowdy from Mattoon, Illinois. $20 per couple and includes activities on Friday and Saturday as well as dinner on Friday night and Saturday breakfast in the morning. Sign up and add your name to the sign-up sheet at the Next Steps booth. And at this time, I believe Sister McKee has a wonderful announcement. Have you ever been to Sam's or a grocery store and you're walking through and they're sitting up, they have a little stand set up with a sample and you're like, I don't know, you know, I wasn't hungry before, but that looks kind of good. I don't want to buy the whole jar. I'm not sure how I feel about it, but then you, you can just take a little taste and see. And then sometimes you're like, that's pretty good. I think I'm going to take a whole box of that. Or it's like, mm, it looks, it smelled good, but it wasn't really for me. But there's just something compelling about a sample. Like you don't have, or you go to ice cream place and they have the little baby spoons and you can taste all the different samples to see which one you really like without having to commit to a whole scoop. Well, what am I talking about? We've decided to do a sample choir for a day where anybody can join the choir for one Sunday just to try it on Cinderella see if the shoe fits you and so that's happening next Sunday all you have to do is show up at 5 o'clock and we're going to teach you one song in 30 minutes and you can sing with the choir maybe you have no intention of joining the choir you just want to get yourself on video and send it to your friends and pretend like you've always been and always will be I don't know um or you want to drag your husband or wife or son or daughter, have a family moment, whatever. Mass choir, open invitation choir, because the following Sunday, it starts for real. And so we just kind of want to give you a sample of what that feels like to be a part of the BOK Sanctuary Choir. So what you need to do in advance, because we can give you the song so you can already kind of know what's going on so you won't feel so... Um, pressured on Sunday, but just meet with Sister Pamela Correa. Right? Will you be standing over here after service and just say, hey, I want to sign up. Do I need to wear something or do something special? And you don't have to sing or audition. We're just going to teach you one song. She'll give you this song in advance and tell you, you know, just a little bit about the dress code. And uh, you can come sing with us just for one day. And if you like it, you can come back Thursday, the 27th, and sign up and join for real. We're going to be singing um, three out of four Sundays um, most we've been on a break since uh, the Christmas concert, and so we're coming back, and then only two midweeks um, a month to practice. So if that's something you feel like you want to just try on, hope to see you meeting with her. And if you don't get to meet with her, just show up next Sunday at five o'clock and join the choir for a day. Oh, taste and see, the choir's good. All right, thanks, love. Goodbye. Praise God, Brother Warden. I'll do it if you'll do it. Brother Gage, I'll do it if you'll do it. All right. Why don't we stand and let's pray over our offering? I asked them because I knew they probably wouldn't do it. 
Oh, they're going to do it? Oh, my, now I got to do it because I didn't set it in front of everybody. All right. Lord, we love you. Thank you, God, for another opportunity to bless your kingdom. You're such a blessing to us. Lord, bless this offering, this tithes, gift, and giver. Let it go to the furthest of your kingdom. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, God bless you as you come and give. Jesus, lover of my soul, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me, Lord. No matter what I've done, where I've been, what I participated in, Lord, you still love me. Anybody grateful? Other people may give up on you. They may forsake you. They may want nothing to do with you. But there's nothing you can do to stop the Lord from loving you. Look at your neighbor and say, do you know that God loves you? Amen, amen, amen. One more time, give the Lord a hand clap of praise as you're seated this morning. so glad of all the things that constantly change in our world and that happen in our world that we can always count on the Lord. Amen. Brother Gage did an excellent job last Sunday night in his scripture text talking about what can separate us. What can separate us from the nothing is able to separate us from the love of the Lord. Amen. Amen. So grateful for that. This morning we want to welcome everyone to the house of the Lord. Thank you all for coming out and for worshiping with us this morning. If by chance you are a first or second time guest and we were unable to get a card to you, whether a first or second time guest uh, card to you, if you would just slip your hand in the air real quick right now. Uh, we would love to get your information. We do have special gifts uh, for our guests, first and second time guests. So we do want to honor and recognize you. You won't have to stand up or sing or come up here and uh, testify or anything like that. We just want to recognize you and thank you for being with us this morning. Amen. Looks like we have everyone 
covered. All right. Praise the Lord. P.O.K., are you ready to help me welcome our guests this morning? That was a little weak. I said, are you ready to help me welcome our guests this morning? Praise the Lord. We want to make sure that we let everybody know how much we love and appreciate them being here. We believe we're part of the best church in the world. Amen. Amen. Not, not only are we a part of the POK, the Pentecostals of Katy, but we are part of the kingdom of God. Amen. We do have one first time guest, and I, I apologize if I say your name wrong, uh, but I believe it's uh, Glenda Frazell. Glenda Frazell, right here in the middle section. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. We appreciate you. We know that you will be blessed in touch of the Lord before you leave this morning. All right, but we're going to go ahead and stand right now. And uh, when we stand, I want to take an opportunity right now to really thank and appreciate everybody who's joining with us this morning by way of um, Facebook or Revival Radio. Can we put our hands together and thank them, welcome them to the service this morning? Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Anybody expecting God to do something great this morning? I didn't just come to service. I'm not just here grumpy because it's cold. I'm really glad to be here, and I'm believing God to do something this morning. Amen. Amen. So we're going to put five minutes on the board. In these five minutes, shake as many hands as you can. Testify to somebody. Tell them what you're expecting God to do in 2022 for you. Amen. At this time, youth and preteen are dismissed as well.
Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. God is holy. It is the fundamental truth of all crea uh, creation and uh, Christianity. Everything is based on the holiness of God. It's not a sideline issue with him. God is so perfect and pure that the sin of humanity separated us from his holiness. And so the whole redemption plan is needed because of the holiness of God, the righteousness of God. If his word didn't matter, then, then uh, he could have just erased it and moved on. But because he said the day that you sin, the day that you eat of this tree, uh, you, you're going to die. His mercy intervened, stepped into in between judgment and his holiness, and he, uh, he, uh, he brought a plan, a way of redemption. I'm thankful for all that, but all of it comes back to the holiness of God. And uh, I know we don't talk about it as much as we should, but uh, it's, it's part of, of, of the Lord. I mean, if you, you cannot say, I want to know more about the Lord, but I'm not interested in holiness. Amen. The New Testament tells us that, that we ought to be holy, for He is holy. Amen. If you really love Him, that's all, what we ought to pursue is holiness in everything that I do. The, it, it ought to control the places that we go, the things that we listen to, the things that we watch. It ought to control the things that I wear, my, the, the presentation of my life. It ought to resemble His holiness. And... Um, and so it's so important, it's not just internal, that every aspect of my life should reflect the holiness and the righteousness of God. Amen. God is so good. It is good to see each of you here this morning, this beautiful Sunday morning. We are officially in the new year now, and uh, I'm looking forward to all the great things that are happening. This week will be an exciting time, uh, even though it's not a big conference. Uh, just I like for you to know what's happening around the church in case you stop by uh, This week we will be hosting uh, ministers from all across the US and a, a fairly small group, but but a diversity of, of uh, pa Pastors in different areas and uh, in a in, uh, One of two meetings we have every year Remember our our momentum conference. We had church growth and, and leadership This is sort of a pared-down version of that where we feel like it's more um, uh, effective to meet with smaller groups of ministers and pastors. And so we're hosting uh, those folks. And so those of you that have volunteered to help, I want to say thank you. If you would like to volunteer to help, um, you can see Sister uh, Megan or um, Sister Annette. Um, and uh, who else? Anybody else? Okay. Sister Megan. Sister Annette, wave your hand. Uh, Sister Megan, is she here? Okay, she's in nursery today, but you can uh, speak with one of these ladies or just stop by the Connections booth out, out in the uh, foyer and give your name if you're interested in helping out sometime. Whether it's just coming up to serve for a few moments, you can do all of that. But uh, we're so glad to see you in the house of the Lord, and uh, it's just great serving God. If I haven't met you yet, my name is Rob McKee, and I'm the senior pastor here at the Pentecostals. And that beautiful lady that was just leading us in singing is my sweetheart, my wife. Uh, my one true love, uh, and uh, we're, we are so thrilled that you're here with us today. Dr. Wilson is out this morning, but he'll be back this evening. He'll be preaching the word of the Lord this evening, and um, uh, he is our executive pastor, but uh, I'm glad to be here, and um, amen. It's just good to see each of you in the house of the Lord. Turn around to somebody beside you and tell them, you look so much better than I do today. is so good. Amen. Thank the Lord for all that he does. If you're a guest with us this morning and you're looking for a home church, I always like to say this. I, I know it, it can be repetitive for those that hear it every week, but it's important that we say for anyone that's new and you're looking for a home church, uh, it, it's important. It's an, a, such an important decision. It can determine the course of your life. Many families have, have been built around the church for generations. Um, and uh, you know, sometimes your kids will marry other kids from the church. It'll determine your friends, and and it, it could determine your eternity. And so the, your selection, the church that you attend, is it, it's extremely important. So if you're looking for a home church and 
you're not 100% settled this morning, I encourage you to do what we call stick six because you're never gonna get a complete picture of what we're all about, our values, doctrine, um, you know, just our processes uh, until you've been at least six services. And then at the end of six services, you can, you'll get a good picture of what we're about and be able to make an educated decision. But I hope that you've already decided uh, we are an apostolic Pentecostal church and uh, we, we don't apologize for that. The reason why we call ourselves Pentecostal is to tie ourselves to the original church, which began on the day of Pentecost. It's not, Pentecost is not necessarily a denomination. We just called ourselves that because we want to preach the same doctrine that they did in the beginning at the early church. We want to have the same experience. So that's when God chose to start the church is the birthday of the church. Uh, there's no magic to the name or anything like that. We also are often referred to as an apostolic church. And um, that just, it just means that we teach the apostles doctrine. And uh, again, not a denomination. It just is a reference to uh, uh, our commitment to not just preach through the stories of the New Testament, but we take the epistles, which tell us how the church ought to behave from James all the way through to the, uh, to the short chapter of Jude, a short book of Jude. And um, uh, they, were, they were instructions given to the New Testament church on how they ought to live, to correct doctrine, interpersonal relationships within the church, leadership selection. A lot of different subjects are covered through the uh, Apostles' Doctrine. So we, we believe in all that. So we, we're a word church, we're a worshiping church. Uh, we're a church that loves kids and loves, loves youth, and, and we've got a lot of ministries within the church, but ultimately, our purpose for existence is to please God. It's all about the glory of the Lord. That's why we're here, and I hope that you will join in with us. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 21, and we will um, read, jump around a bit in this text. Uh, for those of you who have been here for... A while, uh, you know, we have been walking through the New Testament Gospels and discussing the miracles or the described miracles of Jesus. So, not every miracle that Jesus performed was described. Sometimes it just says, and he healed all who were oppressed or all who were afflicted. We don't know who they were, what they had, what, how he did it. We don't know. And not even not even all of those describe the miracles. John said that if all had been written of what Jesus had said and did, uh, had done and said, then he said, I suppose even the world itself could not contain the books thereof, John 21 and 25. And so not everything he said and did is recorded, but in these particular described miracles of Jesus, we find truths that are more than he can heal blind eyes. It's something more and uh, lessons, important things that are recorded for the benefit of the church today. So we've been going through each of these miracles and sort of extracting the primary idea, the thought, it seems, uh, to the best of our ability for, uh, and uh, of, of what God is using or to speak to the church today. And um, it's, it's been a wonderful experience. Now we're coming down to the end of it. It's hard to believe. Uh, we're coming down to the end of all of these miracles. And um, this is a miracle. Now, we didn't cover the resurrection of Jesus, which is by far the greatest of all miracles. Uh, and uh, where he actually said, I'll destroy this temple in three days. I will raise it up. So he performed it on himself. Think about that. I mean, he was performing miracles and people were amazed. But his, his miracle working power wasn't limited to his flesh. I mean, you talk about some, a, a powerful powerful God that we serve. There was no blood pumping through the veins and the capillaries of his body. Heart wasn't beating. No electrical impulses in his brain. He was laying on a slab and yet still had enough power in his promise to resurrect himself from the grave. That's how powerful the word of God is. Amen. Now, uh, uh, well, let's get into this. Okay. John 21 and, and verse number one. After these things, everybody read it out loud with me. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And on this wise showed he himself. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel of Cana 
in Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and the two other of his disciples and two other disciples. Verse three, Simon Peter saith unto them, I go fishing. And they say unto him, we also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately. And that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? They answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it in, or draw it for the multitude of fish. Now, verse 15. This is after the miracle's over. They come to shore. Jesus has a fire there. They're all eating. And uh, verse 15. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, feed my lambs. He saith unto him again the second time, Son, uh, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Verse 17. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him, said unto him a third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, feed my sheep. We're going to stop right there and we're going to uh, speak to you for a few moments this morning from this idea, live your calling. Live your calling. Turn and tell somebody that as an imperative. Tell them you need to live your calling. God's called you. God's got his hand on you. How many believe that, the, that God's purpose is on your life? You know that God has a job for you to do. How many believe that? Come on, lift your hand if you believe it. I want you to raise your other hand and let's pray that God would stir up our desire to live our calling today. Father, I thank you for every one of these wonderful people that are gathered in this place. Help us to hear your voice this morning. Help us to respond to your call. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. amen. God bless you. You may be seated. The Pikes Peak Gold Rush began in July of, of 1858, and it was centered primarily about 85 uh, miles north of what's commonly referred to as Pike Peak, uh, Pikes Peak, Colorado. It lasted for about two and a half years until uh, February 28th of uh, 1861. But in this short period of time, two and a half years, over 100,000 people migrated to Colorado and engaged um, this dream, this idea that they could strike it rich and, uh, and, and find gold in this, um, in this territory. It became part of one of America's greatest gold rushes. Um, often it's referred to as the gold rush of the 59ers because it was in, in 1859 that most of the uh, uh, the migrants or the, the uh, gold miners um, moved to Colorado. But among all of this, this masses, among the 100,000, there were two individuals. Um, and the, the one I want to describe or to talk about, his name was Robert Darby. And Robert Darby went there with his uncle. We don't quite know his name. Fascinating story. Even after the events that I'm going to share you, he had, he had uh, quite a history um, that, that we could talk a lot about. But um, Robert Darby um, had left Maryland with his uncle to work a claim that his uncle had purchased some time prior. They had had a few tests in the area and discovered that this particular plot of ground that Robert uh, Darby's uncle had laid uh, stake to had, um, and, and purchased had, um, had given every sign of having significant um, gold uh, somewhere in, in all the ore. And so uh, they had sold everything that they had thinking that they would be so wealthy with gold when they got done that they could um, buy it all again if need be. And they made the trip by train all the way to Colorado where 
uh, they begin to dig. I believe I've got a picture of one of the, the miners, if you could put that up for me, I believe, somewhere. Um, that's not me. I believe there's not a picture of a miner. I think I sent that. If, if there is, if you could, uh, there's not. Okay. And so, um, anyway, this, uh, Robert Darby and his, his, um, his uncle, they started, they started working their claim. And so, they, as they were digging, they filled up one of their, their first wagon with, um, with ore for testing. And it showed that there was a large deposit of gold there from all the tests that they ran. And so they began digging relentlessly, got out the biggest drills that they had purchased in Maryland, and they went to work and digging out this mine. But, <clears throat> but uh, after, in spite of what the test revealed, after a month of digging, uh, there was no gold. They found no gold. All the tests showed there was, but they found nothing. And they dug and they dug. Um, and they just got discouraged. Finally, in desperation, after relentless, hard labor days, they decided to give up and to cut their losses. And so they took all of their expensive drilling equipment and they sold it to a local merchant. Don't know his name, but they, they sold it to a local merchant and, um, uh, and at a loss by the way, uh, but they sold it and they returned back to Maryland um, and left Colorado. So this, this merchant now owned all the equipment plus the mining claim, the mine that, that the uh, uh, Darby's had dug. And so uh, the merchant decided as a, a hobby, I'll visit this piece, this plot of ground and I'm, I'm going to take a look at that mine uh, for myself. And so uh, he visited the mine and just decided, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to dig for myself. And uh, he took some of the equipment that, that Darby had left and started digging. And within just a very short period of time, it might have been as in little uh, as, as a day, we don't know, this unnamed merchant hit a vein of gold, not just any vein of gold but one of Colorado's uh, Pikes Peak's uh, greatest uh, uh, veins of, of gold. And it was, he, he would later describe that it was only 36 inches from where the Darby's stopped digging. They were literally three feet away when they gave up. This story is a testimony and a warning to everybody who is, is tempted to surrender to discouragement. I've heard it told for many years in, in all kinds of, of self-help seminars and people reference Mr. Darby, and there's a lot more lessons that you can glean from his life. Um, but, and, and he actually went on to make fortunes in, I believe, uh, uh, insurance back in, uh, in Maryland. But, but the story in this particular moment is that Darby could have been very wealthy if he hadn't surrendered. If he would have dug just a little bit more, it's, it's, uh, perseverance is always uh, worth it. The idea of perseverance through discouragement is part of the purpose of this particular miracle where, there's, where the disciples have this great catch of fish. <clears throat> it's, it's one of the last miracles of Jesus, and Jesus has recently been resurrected, and he appears three times as a witness uh, to the disciples. Now, he makes appearances to Mary and others, and even some of the uh, uh, appearances of Jesus are referenced, like for the uh, Apostle Paul in, I believe, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, he references all of the appearances of Jesus, and he mentions that Jesus appears to James. Well, we don't know where he appeared to James because the Gospels don't mention it. The book of Acts doesn't mention it. He just says, oh, and then he appeared to James. So apparently it was common knowledge that, that Jesus has appeared to all of these disciples in different times. And he does it as a proof. He makes a point, John makes a point in the middle of his record that this was the third time, the, the third time that Jesus has appeared to his disciples, the third time. Now, three times uh, he appears. Now, the purpose, 
has got to be rooted in a fundamental law established by God way back in the Torah. And I'll briefly go through this. There were, there were two times in the law, uh, Deuteronomy, both in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 17 and 6 and Deuteronomy 19 and 15, that God establishes this law of proofs. The law of proofs was a big deal uh, in the law because it, it didn't end there. It's actually practiced quite a bit. Uh, where in essence, uh, God, through Moses, tells Israel um, concerning all of their actions and their behavior and their law, he says, at the mouth of two or three witnesses shall the matter be established. Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, the matter shall be established. The New Testament, again, repeats this principle of proofs, and it's used as a fundamental weight to establish an, uh, of a way of convincing someone of the truth. In 1 Timothy 5.19, uh, Paul writes and says whenever you're making an accusation, for example, against an elder, and they are, they're guilty of something, uh, unless there are two or three witnesses, then you don't need to make that accusation, that uh, reputation matters. Anybody can just claim anything. Somebody say amen. amen. You can make all kinds of claims, but somebody's integrity is on the line here. And if, if you're going to make an accusation, then you need to have substantial proof. And that only comes out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. Uh, Hebrews, again, uses this fundamental principle of God's law and says, anyone who has set aside the law of Moses without, di uh, dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. So nobody will be judged just because you think they're wrong. Because you could be wrong. <laughs> you could be the one that's wrong. You could, have, you could have misunderstood the situation. You could have misread what you thought you saw. How many have ever just believed something and later discovered you were way off? I think we all are. I think we all have had those moments where we thought this is absolutely the truth, but then someone else with perspective, or we go back and we watch the video again and realize maybe that wasn't what I thought it was. I could have, been, I could have misread the situation. So because integrity matters and because um, innocence matters in the kingdom of God, he establishes this law of two or three witnesses. So the purpose of the law of proof is to show that proof matters more than personal preference or personal experience. It doesn't matter really what you personally believe about someone or something. You need perspective and, and the confirmation of others to know for sure. So the Bible is not for any personal uh, interpretation. It's not about what the Bible means to you. It's a common phrase you hear a lot in, in these, I guess, our culture of Christianity. They'll, they'll get in a circle in their way of studying the Bible. They'll read a scripture and they'll say, what does that verse mean to you? <laughs> what does it mean to you? Well, it means this to me. And we get all these crazy interpretations, but, but we need to focus in on what the, the Bible actually means, right. what it's actually saying, not what we think it says. How many would agree with that? Because you can come up with a lot of different ideas, but it is important. And, and so that's why in Scripture, it's important to establish Scripture with Scripture. When I was uh, going through my master's program, one of the, the big debates I remember that I had with a lot of my professors, I, I would use Scripture because I was always taught in Sunday school that you define Scripture with Scripture. You support scripture with scripture. All of it is, it's like a, it's like a blanket. It's like a knitted uh, piece of clothing. You, you can't just pull one thing out without affecting something else. And so, you, you know, I would often use scripture to confirm scripture and said, oh, you can't do that. That was written to somebody else and that had a different uh, audience and, and that wasn't written in that time. But <clears throat> let me tell you, one of the best ways to study the word of God is to find confirmations out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. Amen. If it's important, it's not just recorded once. You're going to find it in several places in Scripture, okay? And, and, um, and so God doesn't want us to be confused about his word. Uh, now, this is not my main point today, but it is an important point when we're studying the word of the Lord that we can find the truth of God woven all the way from Genesis through the book of Revelation. We'll find the absolute word of God, laws, principles established, reestablished again and again and again. 
You know, I don't know if you've ever considered it, but this New Testament gospel that the apostles preached was not preached from the New Testament. <laughs> they were the New Testament. So when they were going everywhere preaching Acts 2.38, what we call the Acts 2.38 message, they didn't have Acts 2.38 to lean on because they were living Acts 2.38. They were preaching the Old Testament. Amen. Now, thank God we have the New Testament because it confirms what the Old Testament has, has uh, signaled and pointed towards. Amen. The law was our schoolmaster pointing us to Christ, but it's, it, it, it's, it's a confirmation you, you, uh, of the Old Testament. It all agrees together because God wants his word to be established out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. Um, so it doesn't matter what your personal confidence is. I'm just believing. I know. I heard somebody once tell me, well, I know what the truth is. I just know people. And they were absolutely wrong. They misread a situation. I'm counseling them, trying to talk them off the fence. They're about to blow up. And you, need to, you need to correct these people. I'm like, you don't know the whole story. That's not true. Oh, yes, I do. I know people. Well, the truth was, she didn't know people. She was completely mistaken. But sometimes we can get in our mind that we know a situation until, until we get a little bit of perspective. And so that's why it's important for us to follow this as a, as a law, as a, as a principle in our own life, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, not just people that agree with what you say. That's important. <laughs> well, I told my brother-in-law about this, and he said I was right. Well, no. You need somebody that was a witness to the event to talk to you about it and to establish truths in your life. Okay, so <clears throat> even Jesus establishes this absolute law of proof in Matthew 18 and 16. And he says, when you're trying to confront somebody, go to that brother and confront him. But if he won't hear you, then you are to return, take with you two or more that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word would be established. Again, using this principle, two or three witnesses. And so <clears throat> out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, everything should be settled. It's, uh, but if that's not enough, then you can take it and you know, then present it to the church. So the appearance of Jesus um, at, uh, at, at, you know, at, at the water's edge is establishing this proof of resurrection. This is the third time. That's why John wrote it. This is the third time that Jesus appears to his disciples, two or three witnesses. He's going above and beyond. Now, following um, this third witness, he will appear to the congregation uh, at Bethany. And, and um, uh, well, it's, it's referenced in Acts chapter 1, but also in 1 Corinthians uh, 15 and 6, that... Jesus appears to 500 people at one time in uh, Bethany on uh, the uh, Mount of, of Olives. And so uh, he does this. He goes through this process that he's preached to everybody else. He, he, uh, he's appeared to them individually. He's appeared to them out of the mouth of two or three witnesses on three different occasions. And then now he's going to appear to the congregation. And so he is, he is establishing the fact, I am alive. I don't want there to be any question I am risen from the grave. And so it, it happens, all of this is happening, and, and I'm going to get to the miracle, but it's important to know the setting, of, to understand the purpose of why this miracle was, was recorded. This happens during 40, the 40 days between the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus Christ. Jesus comes out of the grave, he appears to his disciples, and then for 40 days. He doesn't just ascend up into heaven. I know sometimes we, we get all these things and we sort of conflate it all and, and we don't understand the timing, but it's important to remember that Jesus, when he, when he uh, comes out of the tomb, he doesn't ascend immediately. He spends 40 days where he's appearing to people. Hey, I'm alive. Hey, I'm alive. For over a month, man, over a month. Nothing, it's a weird time for the church, 40 days, where he is showing up at random times to prove I'm alive. I want everybody to understand I'm alive. I got over it. Yeah, I died, but I, I'm good now. Like us. Yes, I got COVID, but I got the antibodies now. It's all good. I'm still alive. I didn't die. Hallelujah. So we're, we're over it. 
You know, that's, that's kind of where he is. And, uh, and so, uh, but it's not an accident that it was 40 days. And um, 40 days represented a time of testing for the disciples and for the church. Uh, this was first established uh, in the wilderness. Uh, uh, and and um, when e- Israel comes out of Egypt and they go through the Red Sea, you, you would think they would make uh, you know, a direct line for the promised land and they would be there the next day. But, but God has to take them into a time of testing for 40 years. They're wandering in circles before God brings them into the promised land. They're delivered. They're headed towards the promised land, but they're not there yet. And now they're just in this 40-year period, this time of testing. That's well established in Scripture. That's what the purpose of that was. It was a time of testing. Jesus fulfills the same thing out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. Here he comes, and he establishes the same principle of 40 represent a time of testing. When he comes up, up to the Jordan River, John is baptizing his disciples, and John points his finger and says, Behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sins of the world. And Jesus steps down into the water, and John baptizes Jesus. He comes out and, of the water. You would think now it's time for him to start his ministry. But when he comes out of the water, he goes into the wilderness and he stays there for 40 days being tempted by the devil. 40 days, over a month. The declaration, I'm the Lamb of God, but nothing's happening for 40 days. A declaration that, that, you know, I am, I'm the one that's going to be the Messiah that's going to take away the sins of the world, but now... Nothing's happening in my life. Just kind of in this weird intermission of life. Anybody ever been there where you're kind of between, uh, you know? Now, at the end of the 40 days, after he's been tempted of the devil, Scripture says that he enters into Galilee walking in the power of the Spirit. He begins his ministry, starts healing people and and, and doing all the miracles that he does. But, But he's not there yet. Now he's just in this time of testing and trial. The church is going through the same thing. The church has seen the resurrection of Jesus, and they're going to see the Great Commission, and they're going to see Jesus ascend up. But right now, they're in this time of testing, this time where they, nobody knows what's happening. Yes, Jesus is alive, but what do we do? What's our purpose? He's not here. We're not listening to him teach every day. What, what do we do? I mean, I'm sure they had a few meetings. They got together and tried to determine what are we, what's our purpose. All right, guys. Yeah, Jesus is alive. What, are, what exactly are we going to preach? That Jesus is resurrected? Okay, got that one. Week one, we preached that message, that sermon. I don't know what I'm going to preach next week. Oh, yeah, Jesus is alive. What's the kingdom doing? I don't know. I'm just in this weird lull, this weird time where I don't know what my purpose is. I don't know what I'm called to do anymore. And it's in this period of testing that Simon becomes discouraged. Now, it's, it's, it's not apparent at first, but we see from the conversation that Jesus has with him around the fire that Simon was experiencing a moment of spiritual discouragement. And uh, it's... It's, it's, it's sort of this, this strange time, not only of testing for the church, but a time of testing for Simon Peter. Now, it wasn't, when he said, I go a fishing, it wasn't him saying, you know what, I got a day off, I'm going to go relax. Like some of us like to do. I, I, you know, it, get a day off, man, I want to go have some fun. I don't have anything, any appointments today. This is weird. I want to take advantage of it. It happens so rare. I'm going to go. I'm going to have fun. I'm going to take a day off. And that's not what was happening here because, and we know it because of what uh, some of the things that Jesus says later on. Uh, He he wasn't just making, taking a break and having some personal leisure time. Simon was literally going back to what he used to do. Simon was going back to where he was before He became a disciple back in Luke chapter 5 whenever Jesus calls him and says, Simon, you're you're a fisherman, but I'm going to make you a fisher of men. He's literally 
regressing back to that moment. You know, I don't know what I, we're doing, so I'm, why don't I just go back to the life that I know? I had some great moments following Jesus, but I'm just going back. And <clears throat> it, it's during this time that the kingdom sort of seems to be in a, in a timeout, a hiatus, a time of silence. And the work and the purpose of God was sort of in a, in, in a, in a uh, dormant state an intermission between the acts of God. And it's in this moment of downtime for the church that the church is tested, Simon is tested, and now he's showing a sign of weakness and he's surrendering to the temptation to return to his old life. In this moment of weakness, Jesus appears and the purpose of all of this miracle, it seems to be, and it, Stay with me for a moment. It seems as though the purpose of all of this being recorded really comes down to this one idea that Jesus is trying to pull Simon Peter back into alignment with his calling. Simon was tempted to go back and Jesus is saying, all right, you're in a time of testing, but in this moment of testing, don't become discouraged. When you don't know what to do and you, you're kind of stuck between, man, that powerful experience there and what God's promised, and, but nothing's happening right now, don't be discouraged. Stay focused on your calling. Amen. I love how Jesus begins the dialogue. Here's what he says. Have you any meat? Or my translation, some other translation said, have you caught anything? If it was today, here's how we would say it. How's that working out for you? Uh, how's it working out? That, <laughs> that fishing gig that you thought you could go back to. You thought you'd just drift, fit right back into that old way of living. How's that working out? And Simon says, we have caught nothing. No, haven't caught a thing. Simon that, that day learned an important lesson that many of us need to understand. Once you have been called, and once God has anointed you, and, and once you've been transformed, and you I'm not talking about just coming to church or being in church. I'm talking about being on fire for God, walking in your purpose, knowing God's hands on your, on your, once that happens to you and you've, you've operated in your purpose and you've been used by God, once, once you have, have walked in your calling, the old life just doesn't work anymore. You can't ever go back to just living life and feeling the fulfillment that you used to feel. Perhaps that's what what Jesus was referring to when he told the woman at the well in John chapter 4. He said, I've got living water, and once you drink of this, you'll never thirst for anything else again. Everything else will pale in comparison. It won't taste good. It won't matter. Once you've walked in purpose, once you have, have heard my voice and you followed me, the old life, the old life just doesn't satisfy. Amen. When, when you try Jesus, what you used to try is empty and it's fruitless, it's barren. Once you've tasted the glory of God, once you've experienced God's purpose in your life, the things that used to give you joy are now empty. What happened to the joy that I, I used to have a lot of fun hanging out with my, my buddies and my friends and doing a lot of this stuff, but now it just doesn't satisfy anymore. I'm speaking in the Holy Ghost to somebody who is, have, have been tempted. You might have even drifted back into that old life and you're wondering, where's the joy? Where's the fulfillment? It's not there anymore. Once you've tasted of the Lord, once you've got into his kingdom, once you've walked in his purpose, you will never be satisfied going back. Never be fulfilled. The fulfillment you once experienced is now hollow and it's vacant. And so Simon needed a reminder of what God had called him to do. No, Lord, we have caught nothing. We fished all night long and we have caught nothing. And Jesus makes this ridiculous statement. He says, cast your net on the other side, on the right side, uh, for, for a harvest or for a great catch. 
Now, the direction was irrational to a professional fisherman. If there's no fish, uh, fish where we've been fishing, there's no fish three feet away on the other side of the boat. I've been fishing here all night long, and you're telling me to cast a net three foot away, and I'm going to have a catch. Well, the, can, can I stop and just say it's not so much about the location. What mattered in this moment was, Simon, you just need to trust my word because the real harvest is not in what side you're fishing on. All you need to do is learn how to obey my word. What'd you say? You said what? Whatever you said, if I will do that, there will be a catch. He could have told him to throw it up in the air and he would have caught something. He could have told him to, to, to just throw it out on land and he would have caught something. The, the secret to it is obey the word of God in your life and there will always be a harvest. Hallelujah. Some of us have spent far too much energy trying to look for the keys to success in life because we're in this time of testing and in this law between what God has done for us in the past and what God will do for us in the future. And we're looking for keys to success. I want to tell you, in this season of testing, what you need to hold on to is the Word of God, is the success meter in my life. If I will just do what God tells me to do, there will be a harvest right now. In this, this time of testing, it's not about the location because all, all it takes is obedience to the word. That's what makes the difference. In that moment, Simon was reminded that when you obey Jesus, it pays off every time. Just a word from the Lord, a word that may not make sense. If I obey a word, obedience will always produce results. Just obey it. Just doing what he said is going to bring a harvest during this weird time. Simon Peter, you don't, you don't need to go back to your old life to make ends meet. If you, don't, you don't need to surrender your calling to provide for your future. There's some evidence uh, at the end of this. Jesus makes a statement that he said, Simon, when you're young, you gird yourself. When you're old, somebody else will gird you. It's, it's possible that Simon may have been concerned about his future, and that's why he went out and went fishing. He was concerned about, well, I can't just live here in this dead time. I know Jesus told me to abide. He told me to wait, but I can't just do nothing. I've got a future to provide for. I've, I'm, you know, I've got to take care of my future. And so it just makes sense for me to, to go out and go fishing. Whatever excuse you have to tell yourself, the enemy will provide a lot of excuses to try to get you out of what God's called you to do. Always have a pragmatic excuse that just makes sense. Now I realize not everybody's called to preach, but everybody has a calling on their life. Every one of us. And unfortunately, many of us have surrendered what God has called us to do personally for reasons that we consider pragmatic and logical. Well, it just makes sense. And so at the end of this, Jesus is telling him, you, you know, you gird yourself, but in, when you're old, somebody else will gird you. What he's trying to tell him is if you'll just be faithful to what I called you to do, somebody's going to come along and take care of your needs. You've got to stop worrying about the future. Don't make your future here on earth a priority. Make your future in heaven a priority. That's what he's saying. Now, Amen. Amen. I, I, I think it's important that, that we remember, you know, it, yes, we can invest. Yes, we need to save. It's important to save. Save money. Get, save in your IRA, your Roth or IRA. Make sure that you're putting money. That's not what I'm preaching at all. Please don't misunderstand me. But when all of that becomes our priority in life, we are out of balance. We have surrendered what God's called us to do. And now we're going back to the old way of living before we met the Lord. Amen. Amen. Fish <laughs> cannot be my priority. I'll get to that in just a moment. Now, you're called to obey. Obey your calling and trust God's word. Now, the Bible says that there were 153 fish. Now, there's a lot of debate on why that number was recorded, and I dug it all out. I, I ran everything. I got my calculator out, and I tried to figure it out, honestly. I mean, I divided numbers, and by the number of the disciples, I tried to find stuff, and 
Couldn't find anything that made any sense. And as I'm digging through all of this, I found uh, a, a record, a historical record. And I'm not telling you this is absolute. I'm just telling you what I found, okay? And, uh, but this, uh, this was not from Scripture, but it was based on a historical record, amen, of the New Testament church, amen. Praise God. And, and it was by the early church father, uh, Jerome. And Jerome was a historian. He was, uh, he was an intellectual. They considered him a scientist in their age, a man of science. They considered him um, a, a theologian. And Jerome lived around 424 um, uh, A.D. And uh, one of the things that, um, that Jerome said about this particular uh, miracle, he said that there is a recognized understanding that in the area of Jerusalem, there are literally 153 species of fish. And so if that's true, which I believe it is, now there are over 3,000 in the world, but there, there are 153 species of fish in the area of, of Jerusalem. And so what he... If that's true, then I believe the purpose of this miracle was that Jesus was bringing Simon back to his primary calling of reaching every diversity. Amen. He was trying to tell him, Simon, I haven't called you to go catch fish. I have called you to reach the world. Remember back when I first called you and I told you I was going to I was going to take you out of that profession. I was going to make you a fisher of men. I'm reminding you of that again because I've got a revival for you, not just in the Hebrew culture, not just among the Romans and not just among the Greeks or the Samaritans. I've got a revival for every culture. It doesn't matter who it is. My church will have diversity. Everybody's going to have revival. If you believe it, say amen. Turner, why don't you stand to your feet and lift your hands and thank God for the truth that we have. Hallelujah. Amen. There were 153 different varieties. You may be seated. Now, according to the Hebrew record, um, this this was true. Now, I I, uh, I I really feel like that in times of testing, it's important that we live our calling. Musicians, please come. We've got to stop throwing nets and 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 expecting to experience fulfillment in our life by doing what we used to do. Jesus called Simon Peter to the shore and he asked him the question, Simon. Do you love me more than these? Now, I thought this was powerful. He, he, he asked him the question, Simon, do you love me more than these? It wasn't a reference to the disciples. It was a reference to all these fish that were laying out on the shore. He was saying, Simon, do you love me more than these? Well, yes, Lord, I love you. Well, then you, you need to feed my sheep. Simon, do you love me? Yes, Lord. Then you need to feed my sheep three times. Now, some have debated that it's because Simon Peter denied the Lord three times. I don't know if that's the case, but it does make sense. It could have been that he wanted, to, he, he wanted Simon to, uh, to have his own three witnesses out of the mouth of two or three witnesses three times. I'm going to ask you the same question, and you're going to say it. I don't want you to misunderstand this principle that if you love me, more than that other stuff, you need to focus on your calling. You need to focus on what I've called you to do. Feed my sheep. And so it's time that you live your calling. It's time to fulfill what God has called you to do. What God tells Simon, and I, we could take a long time, and I, and I don't want to belabor it anymore, but God was, was, was trying to show Simon Peter that I'll take care of all your finances so don't hide behind prudence or provision or diligence for the reason why you can't fulfill what I've called you to, to do you, you, you've got to work you've got to invest, say, but don't ever exalt anything above your calling above all else you need to live what God has called you to do be faithful to his call amen God's, God's work through you in your life must come first. The, this last miracle of Jesus, and I close with this, 
seems to be focused on pulling us back into our calling. I, I, I know 2021 has been a very difficult season for a lot of people. This world has been through some times of testing. It's been through a lot of difficult seasons in our life. And it's so easy during this time to sort of get into the survival mode where we just, I'm just existing, just making do. We used to serve in ministry. We used to be involved much more than we are today. Whatever it was that God called us to do. We used to do a whole lot. We used to sing in the choir. We, we used to serve as usher. We used to serve in AV. We used to preach. We used to teach. Whatever God's called you to do. We used to be more involved than we are now. But we have made excuses during this season. We called it prudence. We called it diligence. And we called it foresight and wisdom. And all of those things. But the truth is... All it really is, is us reverting back to what's comfortable and we're throwing empty nets. Don't understand why we're frustrated. Don't understand why I don't have joy, why I don't, know, I don't feel purpose anymore. And so the Lord just sent me here this morning to, to call us back. Yeah, you've been distracted, but you need to come on back. It's time to come on back. Simon, do you love me? I thought it was interesting. The love of, of God is connected to the purpose of God in our life, our job. If you really love me, you'll do what I tell you to do. I'll take care of you. But if you love, you can't say, I love you, Lord, but don't do what I ask you to do. <laughs> my, 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 my family, my friends are those that obey my commandments. So, so if you're not living in your purpose, it's connected to your love for God. So if you want to rekindle that love for God, it's time to return to your purpose. Let's stand together. The Bible gives us clear indication that God's got a job for every one of us. Everybody here has a ministry in their life. I realize this is an unusual message to preach on a Sunday morning, but I feel so strongly that God is trying to bring us back into alignment. If there's somebody here this morning that God's been speaking to you lately, reminding you that you've drifted. <laughs> you should be serving, but you're back fishing. You're doing a lot of the things you used to do with the people you used to do them with. You kind of drifted away. You headed back. And it's, it's not without cause. You've got some reasons. One, you got to provide. You say, well, I need to provide. Yes, of course, we understand that. There's no evidence that Simon was going hungry. There's no evidence that he was about to lose everything. The Lord told him to go and, 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 and you know, tarry. And, and he, he had a purpose in that moment. But he, for, for whatever reason, we, we drift. And the second reason was that there was nothing happening. Nothing happening. I might as well go back. The truth is, what we've got to do, and when we don't know what to do, we need to do what we know to do. When I'm living in this weird time of confusion, the worst thing that I can do is go back to my old way of living and start throwing nets again, coming up empty. What I've got to do is stay in the purpose of God. Yes, I need to work. Yes, I need to take care of myself. But, but the work of God through my life has got to be the most important thing. I promise if you'll just operate in your calling and walk and live in your calling, God will take care of things in your life. He'll provide for you. He'll make a way for you. Stop throwing and pulling up empty nets. It's not going to start working all of a sudden. God's, God's called you for something greater. And he will provide. God will bring the right people to support. God will do it all. But you've got to make his purpose and his kingdom preeminent in your life. It's got to be the most important. The thing that wakes you up in the morning shouldn't be, I might get a raise today. I, I might be able to work some more hours and get more money. That shouldn't be the driving force in our life. It ought to be, I might meet somebody and tell them about the goodness of the Lord today. I might, I might be able to teach a Bible study today. I'm going to get to pray today. I'm going to get to talk to God today. That ought to be the driving force in our life, obeying the will of God. When, when Simon gets this great catch of 153 fish, now, <clears throat> he, he pulls it in the boat, and 
And uh, the, the Bible says that when he realized it was Jesus on the shore, he jumps out of the boat and starts swimming to Jesus. And I, I just, I feel like somebody needs to take that drastic an action today. Somebody needs to jump out of the boat they're in. Somebody needs to take a step towards Jesus. I know most may not understand what I'm talking about, but there's somebody that's connecting, and you're hearing the voice of God this morning. You know what you're doing right now is not what God's called you to do. You know it. You know you're not living in your purpose. You know that you're not doing what you once did. You've drifted, and God's, God's speaking you, to you this morning and telling you it's time to come on back. It's time to come back to your purpose. With every head bowed, every eye closed, if you're here this morning, you hear the voice of God beckoning you and pulling you back into your calling. I wonder if you would just acknowledge that, not between, not to me, but to the Lord. Just lift your hand. Lift your hand to the Lord and say, God, I hear your voice. I know I'm not living in my calling. I know, Lord, I've drifted away. Lord, I know that I've, there's areas in my life that I'm not serving you. And Lord, I need to get back into that place. Amen. Now I wonder if you could lift the other hand. And with your, with your head lifted, open your mouth and surrender to the Lord. Hallelujah. God, I give it to you. I give you everything. God, you are my purpose. You are my calling. God, I surrender all to you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. God, I surrender everything to you, Jesus. I surrender it all to you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. We love you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God, we love you. And now I'm asking our ministers to come and stand across the front here. If you are ready to make a change in your life, I want to challenge you as a commitment between you and God. I know you could stay in the boat. You could stay right where you are and, and maybe just eventually get back to it. But, but I think it's important that you take a step of faith. And so I want to open up this altar for prayer. If you're ready for a change, I want you to step out of where you are and make your way to the front right now. Our ministers will pray with you. I believe God will speak to you. He's going to restore purpose in your life. He's going to store, restore reason and drive and meaning and kindle that anointing in your life. Come on. Aren't you tired of the empty nets? Aren't you tired of all that long pulling up nothing? Come on. As they begin to sing, come on, take that step of faith. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, my life is in your hands. Yes, Lord. All my dreams. Just you and the Lord. He's calling you. Come on. Plans. Your nets are empty. Lord, I place them in your hands. And I give myself away.
Withholding nothing. Yes, Lord. Withholding nothing. Withholding nothing. I surrender all to you. To you, Lord, I give everything. 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 I give. I give. To you. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I, I don't think it's a coincidence that the Lord chose the final miracle he ascended to pull the church back into its purpose to remind us that there's going to be a continual revitalization in our life we've got to continually go through a personal revival God's got great purpose for us I mean if you read the history throughout Acts of Peter and John of course Simon Peter and all the impact that he made even Nathaniel whose name is not mentioned much in the Gospels but Nathaniel Bartholomew also known as Bartholomew would eventually uh, convert Polymeus, which who was the the king of Armenia, this this man would literally win the head of state of over all of Armenia, and 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 experience incredible uh, uh, growth of of, of uh, revival throughout Armenia. Some say that he was also the key to revival in all of India in that season. So God's got great purpose for us on the other side of this, but in the middle of that. If you're Simon Peter, you need, to, you need to stay in your purpose. But if you're somebody else who's being led and pulled away by somebody who's distracted, be careful in those moments. Because just like Simon Peter had purpose, God's got purpose for you too, Nathaniel. Bartholomew, he's got a, he's got a harvest for you as well. And, and, and listening to the wrong voices in this moment of distraction, this moment of testing, can pull you out of what God's called you to do. I'm so glad we serve a God of mercy that will send somebody and send his spirit. Amen. It may even be through a song on the radio. It might be through a witness, something we see, maybe a message, maybe a scripture. But God will send roadblocks into our life and he will begin to minister to us. Amen. I'm so thankful that God loves us. God cares about us. Amen. God is so good. Amen. I'm going to operate in my purpose in 2021. I'm going to do what God's called me to do. I'm going to get back to where I really need to be. Amen. Thank you for being here this morning. To all of our guests that are with us today, I want to say thank you for being here and asking Brother Ryan Bracken to come, one of our ministers. He's going to pray a prayer of dismissal. After he's finished praying, you can consider yourself dismissed. I encourage you to be back again with us this evening. And if you're a first or second time guest, please take your, um, your token that you received over to the coffee shop. We got some gifts. Even if you hated the service, you hated the sermon, hated the singing, just you might as well get the free stuff because uh, everybody likes free stuff. So uh, we got some free stuff for you and uh, over in the coffee shop. And um, we want to at least say I, it, our way of saying thank you for, for trying us out this morning. And I believe that God is going to be with us. And so uh, we'll see you back here then this coming um, uh, well, tonight at 6 o'clock, Dr. Wilson will be preaching. Is choir singing tonight? No choir tonight. We're going to have a great church anyway. Amen. Brother Bracken, would you come? Thank you, Jesus, for this day. God, you're so good. Lord, thank you for the call that you've placed on each and every single life. Lord, I'm asking you to allow us to continue to pursue that calling with fervor, with strength. God, renew passions, renew burdens. 
Lord, we love you. We thank you for what you're doing in our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're dismissed. Yes.